we think after a couple of years of doing this, we'd have it all figured out. Uh, thanks for joining us today with the uh, NSBA here talking about last night's State of the Union. I appreciate everybody's time, and I think we're going to have a great conversation today. My name is Molly Day, and I'm the VP of Public Affairs here at uh, NSBA. Uh, on today's call, or today's meeting, I suppose, you'll be hearing from NSBA President and CEO Todd McCracken and VP of Government Affairs Jody Milanese. They're going to provide a detailed analysis on the President's address and the Republican response, uh, what small business issues were raised, uh, where NSBA's priorities stand, and what's realistically ahead in uh, the next couple months of the uh, midterm election year. Um, all lines have been muted. We're going to keep it that way. We're expecting um, well over 100 people on the uh, meeting. So uh, we will be taking your questions toward the end of the call. Um, you can ask questions anytime throughout our conversation through the Q&A platform. Um, uh, we do ask you to submit them there. Again, if you just check on the bottom menu bar, you should find a Q&A button. Click there, put your question in. We do want to try and keep the chat relatively clear. So um, again, questions through there. If you're dialing in from the phone, um, you can press star nine during the Q&A session and I can unmute your phone. Uh, we do ask you to keep the questions relatively short and uh, on topic. Our goal is to end this by 1130, give everybody a couple minutes back on what we had initially planned. So um, we also wanna just a quick reminder that all of your comments will be publicly available. We will be recording this session and uh, posting it on our website afterwards. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Todd McCracken. Thank you very much, uh, Molly, and welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, to have a little bit of a analysis and discussion about what some of the plans the president talked about last night uh, may have on small the small business community. Um, I'm going to provide just a little bit of sort of overview, and then our vice president of government affairs, Jody Milanese, is going to give us a little more detail on some of the proposals and other legislative activities we're working on. Uh, obviously, it was a little bit of an unusual address last night, given the situation in Europe and Ukraine and uh, how much of time and attention the president had to devote to that. Um, it's also was unusual in given how late it is. I cannot recall in my many years of watching these addresses and analyzing them, one coming so late in the year as this one, uh, especially in the second year of a presidency. Um, so, uh, so, so that was uh, unusual. Um, but I also think uh, it was unusual in that uh, we've gotten used over the last, I would say, 15 years of small business uh, concerns and issues playing a fairly important uh, part of these addresses and of, uh, of any administration's agenda. And, you know, we didn't hear a lot about that last night, actually. Uh, I'd like to chalk up a lot of that to the, the lack of time. Um, but there's a number of small business issues that that didn't get addressed and to the extent they did get addressed, they didn't get addressed from the small business perspective. One of the big ones we hear about all the time from the small business community now, as you all will know, is, is the difficulty in finding and keeping qualified uh, employees and workers. Uh, the, it really is very nearly a crisis for many companies uh, right now. Um, and uh, we do think there's some key ways, especially in a little bit longer term, the federal government can help. I mean, the president did talk about strengthening community colleges and a few things like that, but there wasn't really a clearly laid out agenda for uh, for improving the uh, uh, situation. Uh, he did talk about the supply chain. Uh, the supply chain disruptions are the other thing we're hearing, a uh, relatively new thing we're hearing consistently from small businesses. Um, uh, unfortunately, and again, we can talk this up to the length of the uh, other issues in the address, but there weren't a lot of specifics on it, but the president did acknowledge it was an issue, a big issue that needed to be addressed. He spent a lot of time on inflation, though, uh, and that was that's a good thing. That's, that's another issue we're hearing increasingly from small businesses because inflation stands to have a, a, a pretty significant negative uh, uh, consequence for the small business community. Um, unfortunately, you know, he addressed it from the perspective of how to protect citizens and consumers uh, from the impact of inflation by, by basically creating programs that will reduce their costs of things like childcare, et cetera, prescription drugs, rather than addressing the underlying root of the inflation itself. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, while that could help some families, those kind of spending programs actually are more likely to make inflation worse. So we need to think about how we can actually address the inflationary pressures in the economy. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, one of the ways of doing that is we uh, look look to the 
the future is uh, uh, is that the Federal Reserve has already indicated that they are going to be increasing interest rates. Um, and that's going to put a squeeze on small business capital at an unfortunate time uh, because there's a huge silver lining of good news out there that I also am surprised the president didn't spend some real time talking about uh, because 2021 saw the, 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 the largest number of small business startups in memory. Uh, and it was seemed to be a pretty significant uh, change from what we've seen for really more than a couple of decades in terms of small business uh, and new business startups. Um, and uh, 2020 also saw a significant uptick. So there does seem to be a trend of, of new business startups. And uh, we had hoped that uh, there'd be a lot more attention to a applauding that and b talking about how we can can continue and sustain that into the future. Um, and uh, the other thing I think that the president specifically missed, I, I think, in, in mentioning is, is uh, a, an easy win for the administration this year in that regard would be to uh, reauthorize the Small Business Innovative Research Program, which is up, which is expiring this year and provides you know, significant research opportunities for the federal government, but also uh, some important uh, funding and opportunities for some of those newer and smaller businesses as they get started. So that's kind of my overview uh, of the speech um, uh, from, uh, from the thing we think he should have mentioned. The, the thing that we're disappointed that he mentioned uh, and talked about was a lot of the of the labor and uh, wage issues he discussed uh, were to make it much easier for labor unions to organize and to, and to vote into very small companies and can convert them to union uh, shops uh, and to see a, a, a uniform national uh, relatively rapid rise in the minimum wage. Uh, and, and those are things that simply put small business in a really difficult position. and. Uh, uh, and, and I think Yuri will talk a little bit more about those. But those are things we've been working on for a long time and trying to uh, reform in a way that could be more workable for the small business community. So I'll stop my piece there uh, and uh, uh, turn things back to you, Molly. Thanks. Thanks, Todd. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a, a really great um, summary of, of what he talked about. Um, Jody, um, can you can you talk about what else we heard from her, who else we heard from last night? Yeah, absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. I uh, did just want to quickly mention before we get into some of NSBA's key issues is the Republican response that came from Iowa Governor uh, Kim Reynolds. Uh, she uh, is really has been attracting national attention over the last couple of years, basically in her response to how her state handled uh, the pandemic. She mentioned, um, you know, condemning mass mandates and vaccine requirements and school closures that had prevented uh, children from having in-person learning and she didn't really outline uh, an agenda or legislative uh, priorities, which I think we were hoping to have heard a little bit more of that. But I would say, I think by picking uh, the governor to give the response, it really is uh, the goal of the Republican party to show that um, they, you know, they're sort of like a new face of the party and trying to get away from um, maybe what they were or what they stood for and now just kind of showing they want to keep schools open, they want to lower taxes. She obviously mentioned the inflation rate. Um, she mentioned the border crisis and what's going on in the Ukraine. Um, I think just trying to make that appeal to um, to the voters, especially as we're heading into this midterm election. Um, that is definitely on the minds of all the lawmakers. They want to quickly wrap up as much as they can here in DC so they can get home and, and start campaigning because November will be upon us soon enough. Um, so just wanted to talk also about um, NSBA's priorities and things that are happening now in Washington for the next couple of months while they are in town. Just as a reminder to everybody, if you aren't familiar with our uh, 
priority issues. Um, we unveil them, our top 10 priorities at the start of each new Congress. You can find them on our website. Um, this year, as a result of our Small Business Congress that we held um, about a year ago, um, our business owners are uh, concerned about very obvious things, access to capital, uh, small business role in the federal marketplace, Obviously, the cost of healthcare is always a top concern, as is uh, tax reform. And while those are NSBA priorities that we are always concerned about and focused on and lobbying uh, on the Hill on, we also adjust and pivot to whatever Congress is working on. And so we saw a lot of that mentioned last night. Um, while President Biden did not specifically say the words Build Back Better, it was definitely sort of a deconstructed list of what Build Back Better had been. Um, folks will recall that uh, Build Back Better has been stalled and kind of fell apart when it got over to the Senate, but a lot of the priorities that he mentioned had been uh, really the pillars of what that was. And so things such as uh, paid family and medical leave and universal pre-K, uh, higher taxes for corporations, the, um, the uh, lowering of the prescription drug, uh, drug prices. So all of these were made up what uh, Build Back Better was. And NSBA has been working uh, on some of these key issues. Uh, specifically, I'll just mention a couple of them to highlight for you that we've had some real concerns about and we've expressed those to our lawmakers, specifically the ones on uh, paid family and medical leave, which had been mentioned. So uh, what the recommendation is, is to create a four week paid family and medical leave program beginning in 2024. And uh, NSBA and our members have long felt that any mandated paid leave would certainly create complex new regulations. It should be up to the business owner to determine the flexibility and manage their own workforce. And certainly any type of paid leave program um, mandated could certainly worsen our labor shortages that we're already experiencing. So that is one that we've been really focused on and, and paying really close attention to what may come out. Um, he also mentioned last night um, a lot of uh, labor, uh, new labor provisions, specifically the PRO Act. And while uh, President Biden you know, touted the need for competition, uh, to make competition more fair for small businesses, which is certainly a good thing. Um, we, we do have concerns specifically about some of the provisions in the PRO Act in terms of increasing uh, certain fines and what it would do to hamstring small employers when they're pushed up against a, uh, a, you know, a unionization campaign. So we've, uh, we certainly, feel that small businesses can't be absorbing these fines, cost increases that large businesses can certainly uh, handle because they have the resources, they have the legal departments, they have human resources to do this. Um, so these are issues that we have expressed to lawmakers as they're uh, considering this legislation as well. So um, I will say that things that we do expect to get done, you know, while Build Back Better or maybe pieces of it may come out uh, over the next couple of months. I think what they're working on more immediately is uh, this omnibus spending package you may have heard. They recently passed a short-term continuing resolution that uh, will lapse on March 11th. So they have a couple of weeks now to get uh, to get an omnibus package done and flush out 12 appropriations bills that will fund our government through the remainder of 2022. So to, uh, to September 30th, it seems as though they've, um, they've agreed on some framework on some uh, top line spending levels, but uh, we'll be seeing more of that probably in the next week or so. I've heard that Senator Schumer is hoping to bring something to the floor um, as early as March 8th. So certainly 
that is going to be happening in uh, the near term. And just want to mention one other uh, one other bill that he highlighted highlighted last night. It's had several names. It was the American Competes Act and USICA. And I think last night he mentioned it as the Bipartisan Innovation Act. Um, but that that is a comprehensive piece of legislation which um, is really aimed at increasing American competitive competitiveness in critical technologies, building incentives for innovation, strengthening our supply chain, which he highlighted last night as well, and then uh, just reorienting our posture with uh, China's rise. And, um, and so I will expect that to be coming up again probably sometime before Memorial Day. Uh, there's some things that they need to work out as uh, the differences between the House and Senate version. They're in, they'll go to conference and they'll, uh, they'll negotiate those items. And uh, as Todd mentioned, something that was significant included in that is the reauthorization of the SBIR and STTR programs. And so um, it would be reauthorized for five years to 2027. It was an amendment that was offered in the House version. And so NSBA has been supporting our small business technology partners in hoping that that remains when it goes to conference. Um, so I think I'll maybe go back to Molly. I'm happy to answer questions, but just wanted to give folks sort of an overlay of what was mentioned last night that we're working on, but also what we can expect to see in the next uh, month or so. Great, Jody. Thank you very much. Um, uh, just a reminder, we, we are gonna take your questions toward the end, so keep putting those into the Q&A platform. Um, and I do see a couple of hands raised, so we will get to those during the Q&A. Before we do that, I think we'd like to touch base real quick with Todd one last time um, to talk about, you know, what do we expect politically in the next several months as we head into the midterm election? Yeah, it's an interesting period. I mean, the, the, well, the president laid out a number of things he wanted Congress to act on uh, this year. Historically, the second year of uh, Congress, a uh, new presidency, is is less active, harder to get things done because elections are coming up and the the uh, party in, in opposition, uh, currently the Republicans, you know, hope to make gains and they have fewer incentives to uh, uh, to get things passed. And typically, when things do pass, it's in the it's in the sort of the halcyon days early in a presidency. So last year, the president did finally get past his uh, infrastructure bill uh, and the money is beginning to uh, roll out this year uh, from that funding. So expect some 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 positive news from that. But uh, it's gonna be really hard, I think, for, for anything good or bad uh, uh, to pass this year, uh, which is why we're focused on so many of these things that could actually pass and trying to get uh, positive things into them. Uh, it's especially difficult, I think, because the Senate is going to be tied up with uh, Supreme Court nomination, probably some Ukraine stuff. They are uh, uh, currently having a hard time because not all senators are here. Uh, for instance, uh, Senator Lujan from uh, New Mexico has stroke uh, and isn't expected to be back in the Senate for a few more weeks uh, doing work. So. Uh, given a situation where both parties need every single vote within their caucus to pass anything, that also complicates the, how, uh, how, how the Senate can move forward with their work uh, this year. Um, but uh, some things I think will get some, some attention aside from the ones that I are, are already mentioned are um, uh, there's been some uh, uh, speculation about further COVID relief for some small companies, particularly restaurants, bars, venues of, of various kinds. Uh, I think with the rapid decline in the in the uh, uh, current strain of COVID, uh, and the and the and the opening up of of more local and state uh, uh, businesses and demasking and all the rest, uh, I think a lot of the steam has gone out of that. I actually think that's going to be a heavy lift now to get the, the, those things up past. So I wouldn't expect that. I do think there's going to be some increasing attention uh, through the year on. Uh, on on the role that big tech plays in our lives, uh, and uh, and and some maybe some antitrust measures to sort of re-regulate those platforms, and that's something I, I don't think anything will pass this year. 
but I think that's something we all have to pay very careful attention to uh, because uh, uh, there could be real unintended consequences for the small business community in that in that space. I think we really have to make sure we're educating ourselves on what it would really mean um, because more and more comp small businesses are sort of tied into those platforms, especially as we see this huge wave of startups. So many of those companies are doing uh, marketing and and uh, uh, other kinds of, of active business uh, activities on those platforms. And we're going to make sure there aren't unintended consequences as that moves forward, uh, as the eyes are on those big companies and not so much on the impacts, downstream impacts on the small business community. So we'll be watching that this year. Um, and uh, uh, and then uh, we've, I know we mentioned more than once SBIR because there's a real, because that program expires this year and we ought to be able to get that addressed in one of these bills that actually needs to move this year. As you already mentioned, it's in the uh, uh, one important piece of uh, legislation in the House. Uh, the Senate may take that up in, in May. We don't know that it will get passed, but uh, the Senate and the Congress should at least pass an extension of that program for a year, uh, if not a full reauthorization for five years. So we'll be working on that. Uh, but really, it's going to be a, it's going to be a tough political year, I think, uh, to get new stuff done. That's the bottom line. So, thanks, Todd. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, and um, I think I want to jump first to Gary's question, uh, which is: uh, Is there any more COVID relief? Um, you know, for example, restaurants fund outside of the Build Back Better legislation. Uh, well, uh, Jody can add what she, but uh, but but as I kind of said a few minutes ago, I think no. Um, I, I, there's some attention being paid to it, uh, but I think there's also some significant opposition, uh, especially from Republicans, but not exclusively, uh, in terms of putting more money out there. And there's increasing attention to going back and, and uh, capturing uh, those that may have been somewhat fraudulent in the previous round of, of, page, of uh, PPP uh, programs. I think there's probably more momentum behind that right now, frankly. Um, uh, but there's still fairly significant uh, harms that uh, a lot of those businesses have faced and continue to face, uh, and they need some attention. But I, I'm 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 pessimistic that it will move forward now. I would just Any add. Thoughts on that, Judy? Uh, well, I would just mention um, the employee retention tax credit, the ERTC, that um, that had expired. Uh, it was originally supposed to extend through the end of the year, um, but then in the infrastructure bill, it uh, it was cut short and it ended in September, but that money is still um, out there and available. And there is legislation currently pending that would actually reinstate the ERTC and make it retroactive. Um, so uh, small employers um, could, uh, could get the claim uh, for that fourth quarter of 2021. So that is something that we're, we're actively supporting and, and pushing on because that, that money still exists. And, and I know uh, business owners had previously taken advantage of it when it had opened, um, when you were able to get both PPP and uh, the ERTC. And so um, that's something to, to consider. Um, the next question. Uh, well, I uh, so I just want to add quick, quickly to that. We actually would encourage everyone to sort of look into those tax credits because uh, a, lot, a lot of companies assume they might not qualify, but actually will. So I would actually encourage everyone to sort of double check. They're, they're not as hard to qualify for as I think people realize, and that you may only need to, to see some loss for one quarter of the year to qualify for them. So that's all I was going to add. Great. And, you know, along those lines, and I apologize if one of you already addressed it, I was uh, trying to read through some of the chat questions. Um, DJ asks, can the ERTC be used if we got a PPP loan? Her, uh, their CPA said they didn't qualify because they had PPP money. Yes, you can. Uh, when it was first, uh, initially, you could not. Um, they felt it was a sort of like a double dipping. But then uh, with the American, I think it was the rescue plan, they changed that. And so you certainly can uh, go back and and get ERTC even if you had previously gotten PPP. So I would talk to your accountant about that because you you can now qualify if you meet the criteria. Okay. There's some um, uh, kind of a real specific question, so I want to throw it out and Todd and Jody, if you have an answer, great. If not, then we can try and follow up. 
afterward, but um, David Martin asks, um, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, um, have there been uh, increasing complaints for small businesses, such as breach of fiduciary duty, derivative claims, or antitrust claims? Not that I've heard about. Uh, that doesn't mean it, that it hasn't been, but I'm not specifically aware of that. Okay. Um, so another question here. Um, Sandy asks, uh, with the huge wave of startups, business credit challenges would be key to their success. And this is kind of in line with another mm -hmm. um, financing question somebody asked. Um, what can be done to help these this new wave of startups access cash, whereas typically it's really hard, especially in the first years, to get it? Yeah, it's especially difficult because uh, most banks that are where you're going for credit based on the business, uh, you, you got to have a track record, right? You got to be able to show uh, something about the business and, and where it's been, for the most part. Um, but that's actually uh, uh, we, this is not ideal. But so many startups use personal resources, so uh, they'll get a second mortgage. Uh, uh, rely on the wealth of, of other investments that they've had. And, and that's actually why this seems to be a potentially good time for uh, um, uh, startups now because home prices have risen so much that uh, potential entrepreneurs can use equity in their home if they have one uh, to help get their business started. And secondly, uh, the, the stock market has risen so dramatically, even though it's, it's, uh, it's uh, slumped a bit in the last few weeks, it's still at uh, remarkably high levels. So there's, so there's for a segment of society, there's a level of, of accumulated wealth uh, from those two sources that have traditionally been uh, used to start companies. And I think that's what we're seeing now. And I think that's why there's such a distinct difference coming out of this recession as opposed to the one in 2008, 2009. 2008, 2009, the financial crisis had a significant recession. Usually we see a, a, a spike in entrepreneurship after that. We didn't then because home prices actually went down, stock market went down. Uh, so people didn't have the resources to, to, to finance their, to, you know, essentially bootstrap those companies. And now many more people do. Um, which is why, unless government gets in the way or other things crop up, this could be a, a, a fairly a positive period for the for small business growth and startup. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Erica, and it, she says, "It looks like you have the stats on how many businesses were started, but you don't have stats on how many failed due to Omicron, for example. Would these statistics in the future create more recovery fund grant options similar to the idle advance?" So I'll go ahead and handle that one because I, I do a lot of the, the surveying for an SBA and certainly Todd can, can add to it, but um, th there's a lag time. You know, it's, it's a lot easier to figure out when business startups are happening, but when business closures happen, it, it's harder to track that information. And so it, the lag time is longer, trying to figure out why they, they were closed and, and then turning that around quickly and turning that into additional grant funds when we need it, especially when we're talking about this whole, the whole pandemic, things needed to happen very quickly. And so, it's really hard to get that kind of data as quickly as we really need it to be effective. It certainly can be effective for down the road so that we can prepare better. Um, but in terms of you know being really responsive and reactive to a situation that happening right now, that that data is really hard to come by. Todd, any additional thoughts on that? No, that's exactly right. I mean, I mean, when a business starts, there are certain things they have to do. When a business, you know, uh, closes. In many cases, it, it there aren't as many specific things to do that that create those records, and often it just sort of fades into very little activity without the business itself actually going away. So it's very hard from that perspective to track that number uh, in, in quite the same way. Although it is done, uh, but it's it's hard to do in real time. Uh, the way uh, startups can be done more effectively in real time, as you said. So can you can you hear me okay? Okay, I apologize. Something has happened with my earbuds and I can't hear anything. So um, I, oh. I do realize that we are right at about the end of our uh, talk. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, I will we'll call it now and give you guys back some time. Um, if you have any follow up questions, feel free to shoot an email to me, um, press at nsba.biz. Uh, certainly follow our make sure you're getting our weekly advocates. We're putting out all this kind of information about the ERTC 
any kind of idle changes, that's always in our weekly advocate. Follow us on Twitter. We're at NSPS. And um, thanks for your time. Stay tuned, and uh, we'll, we'll hope, hope we'll be talking to you again soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you all.